to the Church of Perpetual Life. My name is Neil Vandry. A number of you are new, never been here before, or have been here for other events. So I'd like to welcome you, as well as everyone who's just now joined us through our live streaming. I'd like to point out the fact that we do have a uh, privacy zone here at Perpetual Life, and that's the back two pews on this side. You'll see that they are marked uh, reserved, and those are reserved for anyone who doesn't want their uh, face or, or uh, to be in the filming of this event. All of our events, we do live stream, we do film them, we have uh, professional editing, and then we have the films of the events at our YouTube channels. So if you'd ever like to review what you just saw you, that night or in the next morning, you'll be able to go to our YouTube channel, which is easily accessible from our website to be able to see what it was that you saw. And I'd like to quickly get into the program because we've got a lot to do tonight and we have a wonderful guest I'm so glad to have here this evening. But before we do, a couple of things. Downstairs we have the cryonics table. We've moved the table on cryonics to be downstairs. If you'd like to see some information, read some information, get some information on cryonics itself, the table is downstairs next to the other table, which is the free table. The free table is a place for you or any of the people here, any of the members, to put information, put down uh, brochures or business cards, to have free exchange of any type about any uh, subject, almost. Uh, I hold uh, editing, uh, editing privileges on that table. So that's the free table downstairs. Feel free to take some items from that. Our donation boxes are in two places today. They're going to be on the registration table as well as near the, um, the bar downstairs. We have a new piece of furniture you might have noticed. Uh, which is where Celeste, our bartender, will be. And also, I want to speak of just briefly, we have our library out here in the outer uh, room of the sanctuary. The library is available to you. If you'd like to check out a book, read it, and bring it back next month, then you're welcome to do that. And that is still on this level over here. We're going to get a bookshelf because we've got so many great books, uh, and our library has grown tenfold since we started back in November of 2013. Finally, I'd like to make mention of the fact that the RAD Festival, the most wonderful, magnificent, amazing festival is coming up August 4th through August 7th. And as a member of Perpetual Life, as someone who's come here to visit with us, you have the opportunity to sign up for the RAD Festival and save a considerable amount of money through the uh, special secret code. The secret code is Perpetual Life, I believe, or Perpetual, excuse me, Perpetual. And if you'd like to talk more about the RAD Festival, by the way, that stands for the Revolution Against Aging and Death. And the RAD Festival in San Diego, August 4th through the 7th, I believe they've had almost 600 people signed up right now, and we haven't yet even given the list of speakers. We haven't given the schedule of who's going to be speaking there. But uh, it's going to be amazing, and uh, it could be a life-changing event for you. So if you have any way of getting to the RAD Festival in San Diego, it's, to me, it's like the Woodstock of the anti-aging movement. So you don't want to miss it. It's the first of its kind, and I believe it'll be uh, repeated as time goes by. The RAD Festival, again, August 4th through the 7th. I'd be happy to give you more information after uh, the event tonight. After the event tonight, we'll have a social hour. Now, next month, on the fourth Thursday of April, Dr. Maharaj will be back here to speak with us about his stem cell uh, project. And don't miss that. If you can be here for that, Dr. Maharaj will be here again. And not like last year. Last year, we were all really quite hot. <laughs> you may recall that. I hope you don't. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything. But um, this year, we've got the air conditioning fix. So Dr. Maharaj will come back. And he won't know where he is because it's so nice and cool. So that's what we're doing next month, and I'll give you more updates as we go along. If you, I don't have your email, please be sure that you email me so that we can stay in touch with you about all of our events. So now we're going to get right into our program, and I'd like to introduce to you this evening a, one, a wonderful person, Catherine, the Chief Operating Officer of Suspended Animation since 2007. She has led Suspended Animation's expansion research and facilities and overhaul of its services service model bringing mainstream scientists, surgeons, and perfusionists, perfusionists into SA to contribute to research and care of cryopreservation patients. Prior to joining SA, Catherine served as the Director of Business Development for Pharmaceutical Platforms and Simix Technologies and as a Strategic Marketing Manager for Applied Biosystems. As a cell biologist, 
in neurobiology at UCLA and in cardiopulmonary physiology. She should be a doctor, in my opinion with the Lovelace Institutes. She pursued research interests in the molecular mechanisms of glutamate in the brain and thermoregulatory responses to hypoxia and ischemia. She has co-authored articles in brain research and the American Journal of Physiology. Forgive me for my mispronunciations, but let's give a warm welcome to Catherine Baldwin. Okay. Glad you're here. Thank you. All right, me and Madonna got the whole microphone thing going on. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, my name is Catherine Baldwin. I am the chief operating officer of a company called Suspended Animation. And um, contrary to uh, another introduction, I think what appeared on the website, Neil kind of gave me an upgrade in my education. Uh, I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on television. And uh, I am a scientist. And uh, by training, I'm a cell and molecular biologist. But I haven't been a bench scientist in decades because I chose to move to the applied side of science and uh, the business side of science. I was interested, in bench science was very interesting, basic research is very rewarding. But I wanted to see good research and technologies transferred out of laboratories and into the hands of those who could actually benefit from that research, whether that was other research laboratories taking advantage of protocols and techniques that had been developed in one lab, or technologies that might uh, apply in the healthcare arena and benefit a much broader audience by improving lives or saving lives. And that's pretty much what my goal has been to do at suspended animation. So for the next 20 to 30 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about suspended animation as a company, okay? Um, a little bit about what we do uh, as our primary mission, a little bit about our research and our development efforts, and um, I'm not gonna talk about human cryopreservation or cryonics tonight because that's not what suspended animation does. We operate in a supporting role to people who have signed up to be cryopreserved, and it's a very important supporting role, but we don't actually do the cryopreservation part, so I'm not the subject matter expert in that particular field. So, um, after my talk, we'll have about 10, 15 minutes for questions and answers. I'd be happy to answer, to the best of my ability, any questions that you might have. And this evening, I also brought our mobile operating room, uh, which is based here in South Florida at our Boynton Beach facility. And it's parked outside. And for those people who are interested in seeing the vehicle that we use to handle cases here in South Florida and up to about a 1,000 mile radius, I'd be happy to give you a tour, maybe half a dozen of you at a time, depending on how many people are interested. Okay, so let's get started. <clears throat> so, Suspended Animation uh, was founded in 2002 with the idea that we're going to bring together science, technology, medicine, and bring them all together in the service of cryonics, okay? Um, the primary mission of Suspended Animation is to take care of and recover human cryopreservation patients. These are donors who use the Uniform Anatomical Gift Act as well as contractual agreements with the two primary uh, cryonics organization in the US, which are the Cryonics Institute in Michigan and the Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Arizona. And Suspended Animation has contracts with both of these organizations to take care of patients. And Basically, why do we need SA? Why do we do this? Well, because people oftentimes, when they are ill or near death, they are not able or not willing to relocate to where they're going to be cryopreserved and stored. They just can't go, or they want to be with their families, or they want to be close to home. And so, suspended animation kind of serves as a paramedics ambulance service specifically for the recovery of these patients who are passing away at a great distance from where they are going to be cryopreserved and stored. So our primary mission is taking care of these patients. We have developed 
systems and networks uh, and protocols to do this. Uh, we're very good at it. We're the only company in the world that does it. The second part of our mission is in support of the first, and that is research and development to develop even better protocols, better technology, better equipment to do our job of taking care of these patients, these tissue donors, even better than we do now. And there's always room for improvement. Um, there's always new technologies, and so we evaluate mainstream technologies uh, to bring them in-house. Uh, we evaluate existing medical equipment to see if it applies to what we do, and if it does, if it can make how we treat our patients better, then we will test and adopt that technology if that's appropriate. We also do in-house development of new technology, new protocols. <clears throat> so in addition to doing recoveries, we also do research and development, and then we have a training component. So we train surgeons and perfusionists, nurses, doctors, uh, those medical professionals who can contribute to the care of our patients. We bring them here to Florida, to our training facility, and they usually spend one to two days with us and train on how to care for human cryopreservation patients. And there's a whole protocol that I'll talk about. Um, and if they're interested, we will train them, but we'll also evaluate them because not everybody is suited for doing what we do. It's an unusual job. Uh, sometimes we operate under less than ideal circumstances and it can be tough. And so not everybody's cut out to do that kind of work. Uh, some surgeons need that big hospital operating theater and six assistants. That's not how we roll. We don't have that luxury. And so sometimes we have to do surgery in a not very nice place, maybe with not all the equipment that they'd like to have, and if they can't roll with that and deliver good service in spite of the circumstances, then we don't want them. Okay, so research, recovery, and training. That's pretty much the things that we do. Now, why, why would you need SA besides just moving or transporting uh, a human cryopreservation patient from where they are to where they need to be? Well, as it turns out, when your heart stops beating and you stop breathing, that immediately begins a change, a lot of changes actually. The environment that your cells are in becomes a toxic one. So there's a release of glutamate, uh, calcium gets released, there are reactive oxygen species in the environment of the cells, uh, there's edema, inflammation, cytokines. This is a cascade. It's not happening all at once, but it's sequential and it doesn't get better as time goes on, okay? So there's a lot of damage happening, and it's happening continuously. Um, it turns out there have been all kinds of studies of various pharmaceuticals, because this is the same condition that we would have if we had a heart attack, and we stop breathing, and our heart stops. All the drugs in the world don't do squat. Nothing, not a thing. But it turns out that if you can take somebody who suffered a heart attack, who stopped breathing, whose heart has stopped beating, and you can cool them even a few degrees, just a few degrees, a little bit of ice, you can stop, you might slow, and in some cases you can reverse all the things that were up there, glutamate, calcium, inflammation, cytokines, all of these reactive oxygen species, Everything in this cascade that begins the process of cell death can be stopped, slowed, or reversed with cooling. And that is the only thing that helps. Okay, so mainstream medicine got interested in this. There was a very large study back in 2002. Now, let me just go back a second. The folks who've been working in human cryopreservation have known about this cooling effect being protective of cells and tissues for hmm, 35 years or so. Mainstream medicine caught on about 2002. Very large study in Australia, about 5,000 people suffering from cardiac arrest. And what they found was if these folks received mild therapeutic hypothermia, it helped protect their brains from brain damage. Okay, so after the publication of this study, everybody was very excited. There were a lot more studies that were initiated. Eventually, the uh, European 
International Liaison Committee of Resuscitation, they're kind of like the American Heart Association of Europe, they recommended that people who are suffering from out-of-hospital cardiac arrests be cooled as quickly as possible, preferably by emergency services responding to their crises. It took a few more years before the American Heart jumped on board, but they did, and in 2005, they changed their guidelines for resuscitation. They now recommend that EMS start cooling you immediately if you have cardiac arrest outside of a hospital. Well, that's pretty interesting, because that's what we do. So there continues to be a whole bunch of studies. There was a fairly significant study in 2010 uh, where paramedics were applying early cooling techniques to people who had strokes, uh, ischemic stroke and cardiac arrest in the field, and people generally had increased survival rates, um, longer survival rates than those who were not cooled. And right now, there are currently 407 clinical trials using therapeutic hypothermia. Now, the application of therapeutic hypothermia has expanded. They're using it to treat Parkinson's, they're using it to treat ischemic stroke, they're using it to treat uh, preemie babies whose lungs are underdeveloped and who wind up with ischemic brain damage because they can't breathe. So there's a lot of different applications. Now 407 clinical trials, kind of it sounds like a lot, but relatively speaking, not so much. Uh, compared to say, for example, the number of studies of uh, obesity in children and adults, there's almost 7,000 of those studies going on right now all over the world. So relatively speaking, interest is still building, the evidence is still building for how do you apply therapeutic levels of hypothermia to people who have suffered potentially life-threatening injury, traumatic brain injury, cardiac arrest, or stroke. But the techniques are coming online in mainstream medicine to treat people using therapeutic hypothermia. So medical protocols, what are the medical protocols? What happens to you if you have an arrest, a cardiac arrest outside of a hospital? Well, EMS is going to, what they call, stabilize you for transport. So the ambulance is gonna come out and they're going to, uh, first they're gonna try to resuscitate you. Yes, there they are in the ambulance. So usually their protocol is to give you cardiopulmonary resuscitation and try and bring you back, get your heart started, get your blood circulating again. Um, also, they're going to intubate you and ventilate you so you can breathe and get oxygen. Uh, and they're gonna give you medications to try to support your blood pressure and reduce inflammation and make sure that your blood keeps circulating. The next thing they're gonna do is try to induce hypothermia, even just a couple of degrees. So your normal body temperature is 37 centigrade. They're gonna try and drop it in the field just by two to three degrees. And that's enough to provide neuroprotection, a little bit of brain help, okay? So the way that they do that now is by giving you intravenous bags of saline. So the, the saline that they hook you up to is cold. They might also put cooling ice packs uh, or chemical ice packs around your uh, neck and your head, okay? Once you get to the hospital, the emergency room, then depending on how they evaluate you in the ER, uh, they may send you directly to a catheter lab and they will thread a catheter up through a large vessel, uh, look into your heart and see if they can see any blockages which they could mechanically get rid of. If things are bad, if you have a valve problem or an aneurysm, they will send you straight into surgery and a cardiothoracic surgeon will open you up and start fixing whatever they can on your heart. And while they're doing that, they're gonna connect you to something called a heart-lung machine, a bypass machine. Bypass meaning this machine is gonna take your blood and send it through the machine to be oxygenated. It'll also uh, run through a heat exchanger so they will cool you using this bypass machine. And so essentially you will bypass the heart and the machine will circulate your blood and breathe for you while the surgeon is working on fixing whatever's wrong with your heart. And this is an image of kind of what that looks like. Okay, <clears throat> so that's how they deal with you and apply hypothermic protocols to people who've had a heart attack outside of a hospital. Now, what does suspended animation do to take care of cryopreservation donors? 
surprisingly, pretty much the same thing. So we do what's called stabilization for transport. Only our transport times are not 30 minutes or 40 minutes. They're usually hours on an airplane moving a patient from one side of the country to the other, to where they need to go. So the level of hypothermia that we have to apply to get you preserved and in good shape by the time you get to Alcor or to Cryonics Institute is quite profound. So we're not trying to lower a patient's body temperature by three or four degrees, we're trying to lower the patient's body temperature by 30 degrees, and that's a lot. Most of the time you can't do that applying cold from the outside, so we need surgery the same way you would um, in an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But our protocol looks pretty much the same. The first thing we do is apply cardiopulmonary support. We're not trying to resuscitate you. We are trying to pump your heart and get your heart to move your blood around. We also intubate and ventilate you, get oxygen going back into your body, and we give medications to help support your blood pressure, keep your blood thin and moving around, try to combat inflammation and edema and all these other things that are happening to you. And the next step, because cooling from the outside is still recommended, can still help, we carry a special ice bath, which you'll see if you take a tour of the vehicle. And so we place a patient in the ice bath and cover them with ice and circulating ice water to draw heat out of the uh, surface of the body. And we also have an IV on the patient, putting in ice cold fluids and ice cold medications, just like a paramedic would do for you in an out of hospital cardiac arrest. And finally, since the fastest way to cool people is not from the outside in, but from the inside out, we contract with cardiothoracic surgeons and cardiac perfusionists, the same people who do your open heart surgery in the hospital, come with us on our case, they work out of our vehicles or wherever we can set them up, and they put our patients, human cryopreservation patients, on bypass. They do same surgery, open up the chest, connect you to the bypass machine, and as your blood is circulating through the bypass machine, it's cooled. And eventually, in the case of cryopreservation patients, we replace the blood with ice-cold organ preservation solution. So now your temperature is dropping at something along the lines of one degree every two to three minutes. A quick question. Is all of your work done after the patient has passed? Yes, it's all done post-mortem. The patient must be legally pronounced dead before we can actually do anything. Although what we do is just like a medical procedure using the same equipment and the same people, it is not considered or sanctioned as medicine. So we use the same personnel, emergency services personnel, paramedics. We have a stable of cardiothoracic surgeons and perfusionists to do our work. <clears throat> And essentially, the function of SA is to bring these personnel together along with the right equipment and the custom equipment that you have to have to do this and the custom vehicles that you need to do this and the facilities to maintain it all because we're on call 24-7, 365. So we have to be ready to go anywhere in the continental U U.S. at a moment's notice. And that's usually at like 2 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Okay, so a lot of my time, uh, besides maintaining readiness of the organization, is also spent recruiting people to work with us. As I mentioned, not everybody is cut out to do the kind of work that we do, and they don't want to be involved or they think we're crazy. But there are plenty of really good people who do want to work with us. So my job is to find them and bring them, and then contract with them. And our surgeons and perfusionists and a lot of our nurses are all managed by companies because I can't keep track of them all and keep them on a call schedule. So uh, right now, our surgical and perfusion coverage is provided by a company that's based right here in Florida. Um, it's called Perfusion, PDC Perfusion Resources and Perfusion.com. They are the largest perfusion services provider in the world, and they work with us. 
The surgeons that we use are not uh, Joe Blow surgeon from you know baby doc school. These are top-notch people. Um, one of our surgeons did his research and training at Texas Heart Institute under Michael DeBakey. For those of you who don't know who Dr. DeBakey was, he was one of the inventors of the artificial heart. Um, and Dr. Stam has done probably, well, the number's probably going up. He's probably at around 7,000 cardiothoracic procedures. He practices in Colorado and flies to our cases. Uh, another one of our physicians who's actually based here in uh, Boca, uh, he was named one of US News and World Report's top doctors in cardiovascular surgery. He has about 26,000 cardiothoracic procedures under his belt. And <clears throat> one of my all-time favorite grumpy surgeons, as we called him, uh, is uh, Dr. Robert Wesley. He's an MD, PhD research cardiothoracic surgeon, and he has about 31,000 cardiac procedures under his belt. And these are the people who work on our patients. We have 12 cardiac perfusionists. These are no slouches either. Um, the average perfusionist has about 10 years of experience and about 5,000 cases at a minimum under their belt, perfusing adults, children, and transplant patients. Does everybody know what perfusion means? Not a clue, sorry. Perfusion just means, it, when you talk about your uh, blood perfusion, it just means the circulation of blood through your whole body. And a perfusionist is somebody who runs that bypass machine, the heart-lung machine, that controls the bypass function of taking your blood out of your body, circulating it through the machine that circulates your blood and breathes through for you and then puts the blood back into you while the surgeon is working on your heart or your lungs or your brain or some other part of you where you really can't have the heart beating. Okay, so that's perfusion. Perfusion is just the flow of blood through your body, either naturally or with a bypass machine. We also work with the elite health group. Uh, this is a group that provides our hospice nurses and skilled nursing care. Uh, we like to be able to recommend uh, solid nursing care because it's hard to find. Uh, these folks are based in Southern California, but we have other nursing resources around the country. Um, and our training component is pretty key because it allows us to demonstrate for people how it is that we perform the procedures that we perform and train them because it's not exactly like the operating room. Uh, the protocol in some cases for treating a human cryopreservation patient is, a, is counterintuitive. It's not medicine. It's not the protocol that you would normally use. Cooling a patient 30 degrees is not what they typically do. So we bring them out to Florida to our facility in Boynton Beach. Uh, we offer trainings quarterly. We wind up having them once or twice a year because a lot of people don't want to come out in July. Um, our training is pretty comprehensive. Uh, we generally do about half a day in the classroom teaching these folks the protocol. Then we do uh, hands-on training with our equipment. And then we all pile into the mobile operating room that I brought with me. And we come down to Miami to work at an animal facility where all of these medical professionals actually go through and do an entire case on a human-sized swine. So I can watch and see how they perform, and they can put it all together and practice with hands-on uh, practice with these animals. <clears throat> so this is a shot of uh, a couple of surgeons practicing uh, in our mobile operating room. So all of the medical professionals that we use have day jobs. They're all practicing. They're not staff members. They work in hospitals and clinics all over the United States. They are contracted to work with SA, and they are trained by SA in the protocols. Whoops. Let's go back a minute. There we go. In 2008, which was about a year after I started recruiting, we had a couple of handful of people in California and Florida. And today we have medical professionals in 14 states. We've also upgraded all of our equipment so that it's standard and it's state of the art. It's what these surgeons and perfusionists are accustomed to seeing when they walk into an operating theater. So what you see up there 
uh, just as an example, is a battery-powered sternal saw. It's very lightweight. Everything we do cannot rely on electricity because oftentimes we're where there is no electricity. So it has to be battery-powered or have battery backup. So this is a battery-powered sternal saw. And then the, the uh, other photograph there that you see is actually of one of the cardiac bypass machines. So these are the things that you find in the hospital suites around here uh, and down in Miami in the heart centers. Um, this is the machine that will pump your blood, take it out of your body, cool it, put it back in, and also help us replace your blood with uh, organ preservation solution. So suspended animation maintains three air transportable kits because a lot of times the patient is someplace where we can't drive or they're in such a dire state that we're not gonna be able to get there in time. So we have to fly. So we've taken all of our surgical gear and all of the medications and the perfusates and the bypass machines and the whole thing and packed it all into hard-sided Pelican cases and then we check all 600 pounds of it as luggage. And the airlines love it when I hand them my credit card. So we have three of those kits, one on each coast plus a backup. So if we need to fly someplace, it's ready to go. And it looks like that, mostly. Each case weighs about 50 pounds. So we don't get the private plane at this point? Well, because I typically do anywhere from zero cases to eight cases a year. So having a pilot on standby, paying the maintenance on the plane, I have looked at it. Uh, I've also looked at fractional ownership, air ambulance services. Um, at some point, it might be price competitive if we have higher volume. Uh, so far, it's not. Uh, we have two vehicles supporting surgery, one of which I brought. Uh, this is the one that I brought, pretty sunset up in Boynton. This is the largest vehicle we have, and that's why we use it for training. It can accommodate about eight people at a time, although when we're doing surgery, it's only three people in, this, in the sterile field and only if they're scrubbed in. This is a smaller vehicle. This is based on a Mercedes Sprinter van. You probably see those guys delivering stuff around. This one has been configured also to do surgery and perfusion. It's a lot easier to, to whip around Orange County and Los Angeles in one of these than the big beast that I brought. So basically, with all of this equipment and all these people and all these protocols, <laughs> we have the ability to do stabilization, surgery, and perfusion on people who have signed up to do human cryopreservation, and we can take care of them nearly anywhere. And we have to do that now because this is not considered medical procedures, and I can't get anybody to do this in a hospital. So if I just, if you take, wind up in the emergency room and you say, well, I, I, got, I want you people to do the human cryopreservation stabilization protocol, they'll be like, hmm, nope, can't help you. And I'm sorry, there's somebody in our cardiac suite right now. And most of the time, in most major medical centers, unless they are a trauma center, they don't have a surgical team standing by that can do this. My guys don't just sit around waiting for somebody to call. So you need to have the surgical personnel and you have to have the equipment and the perfusionist to do this. And most hospitals can't afford to keep these people on standby like we can. <laughs> Not that we could afford it either, but we do. If you're squeamish, don't look at this. Look away. This is Dr. Wesley and uh, one of our surgical assistants and a perfusionist actually performing open chest surgery in the vehicle that I brought. He's uh, actually tying in cannula and connecting this person to the bypass machine, which basically involves two tubes going into the heart. Okay, so we have facilities in California. Uh, back in 2013, we moved our headquarters to Southern California so that we could have uh, more space, more laboratory space, and a better opportunity for recruiting people who work in the medical device industry, industry and uh, engineers who are, um, how should we say, fluent in medical device development. I did not have much luck trying to recruit them here in Florida. And uh, so we ultimately decided that it'd be a better move to take our R&D operations to Southern California. 
We still have our facility. We have a facility here, a new facility in South Florida. It's located in Boynton Beach, and we use that facility just for training and for East Coast response. <clears throat> so this is the California facility, if I can get it to go. Administration and R&D. There it is. It's located in Rancho Santa Margarita, which is uh, about an hour north of San Diego and about an hour south of Los Angeles. And there's our shiny new labs. The Florida facility uh, is training an East Coast response. And this is the training area for a lecture and demonstration. And then we have the large vehicles and the kits stored. So the research side of things, that's all based in Southern California. And the research that we do, again, is really designed to support taking care of human cryopreservation patients and to the extent that we can apply it to a broader community in medicine, we do. So I'll talk about just two of the projects. We have a lot of different projects, but these are the two main ones that we're working on right now. <clears throat> the primary one that I have all my engineers working on right now is portable liquid ventilation. So right now, to cool somebody from the inside out, the fastest, most effective way, we have to have surgeons and perfusionists. We have to cut people open. That means we have to have equipment, we have to have facilities, and we have to have people who know what they're doing. What if we didn't have to have all of that? Or what if we didn't need all of that on site right away? What if there were a way to cool somebody without cutting them open? That would be useful for people who have out of hospital cardiac arrest and need cooling by emergency medical personnel that would also be helpful to our patients, for human cryopreservation patients, cooling them rapidly without needing a surgeon right away. So portable liquid ventilation basically uses the lungs as heat exchangers. Your lungs are highly vascularized. All of the blood in your body passes through your lungs. 70 square feet of vascularized tissue. So if I could simply intubate somebody, which we normally do anybody, two people if you have a heart attack, and then we connect this person to a machine that would infuse ice-cold perfluorocarbon, which is capable of handling gas exchange as well as heat exchange. So the perfluorocarbon goes into the lungs, it does gas exchange, it collects heat, and then it's suctioned back out through the endotracheal tube back to the machine where it's cooled again and recycled back and forth. Okay, so basically we're using the lungs to remove heat from the body on the inside, okay? It turns out that this is really fast, really fast, as fast as surgery, but no surgery required, only an endotracheal tube. So your basic paramedic could use this in the field and treat somebody right at the site of their auto accident, their heart attack, their stroke, whatever. It could be used instantly without a whole lot of skill. So right now, I'll give you an example. So this graph basically shows um, a couple of training exercises, and these sort of long swooping lines show how long it typically takes for a full team, plus a surgeon and a perfusionist, to actually get in there, do the surgery, hook them up to a bypass machine, and start cooling, okay? That typically takes about 35 minutes, maybe more, depending on the team. These are all new team members, okay? So they're doing pretty good, 35 minutes. But what happens when you hook up the same animal or a different, a different experiment, different animal, uh, to a liquid ventilation device, one of our prototypes? Well, that time goes down to somewhere between 10 and 12 minutes. So you've just made 20 minutes of difference in damage control. Okay, neuroprotection, brain protection. So the potential for this device to really revolutionize emergency medicine with respect to patients who would benefit from hypothermia, huge.
huge. What is too long? Three days or three days? So um, you might have heard the expression, the golden hour. Yeah. Most people, if you have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, you have maybe an hour before there's irreversible damage. Everybody's a little different because everybody's body chemistry is a little different, and it depends on how old you are, right? Um, but if you can get somebody, you can resuscitate them, restore their heartbeat, shock them back into a normal rhythm, and start cooling them within that first hour. And then it seems to be, with the latest trials, if you keep them cool over at least a couple of days, so body temperature just a little below normal and keep them there, that seems to reduce the amount of brain damage that they have as a result of no oxygen, no heartbeat. So this could be a game changer, but usually within the hour. Uh, the other research project that we're working on besides portable liquid ventilation is gene expression and biomarkers of cell death. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody who's particularly interested in the detail, but essentially, all that chemicals cascade that I was talking about at the beginning that happens as your heart stops beating and you stop breathing. The other thing that happens um, is gene expression. So the, the DNA in each and every one of your cells starts producing um, different kinds of proteins. So some genes get turned on as a result of this environment, this change in the environment. Some genes get turned off, all right? And that may be good or bad for the cell, but there are many, many genes, hundreds of them that are affected. And we have the ability, using a machine, it's called it's something you really can't pronounce, but it's a 7500 RT-PCR machine. And it essentially allows us to use a blood sample or multiple blood samples to look at a snapshot in time and see which genes are active and which genes are not. So if I take a blood sample at one minute into the procedure for a human cryopreservation patient and half an hour into the procedure, I'm going to see different levels of the chemical cascade going on, different levels of gene expression. And this device will allow me essentially to run analyses of 84 different genes plus 10, well, plus, yeah, 10 controls all at the same time uh, with just a little bit of preparation of the blood. So we're trying to find a target or multiple targets because right now we know there's no drugs that will help somebody who's had a heart attack. It won't protect them. Cooling is the only thing that will help them. But if we could find something that we could target in the genes that we could turn off or turn on even before somebody dies, that might be helpful. So that's the other major research project that we have, and that's collection of blood during a procedure, both on animals and humans. Yes? Liquid ventilation. It's in the prototype stage right now. It is not a commercially available device. Uh, and it's not at, the prototype is not at a stage where anybody other than an engineer or an expert can run it. Uh, it is our goal to produce something that is user friendly uh, for somebody with minimal medical skills to use and that will be inexpensive and disposable. So basically, you use it once and throw it away. I would never say, because my engineers are, well, they're engineers. And uh, yes? How many uh, patients have you prepped procedures have you done? Ooh, um, I think, don't hold me to this number. Since I started at SA, I think I have personally done 30 cases. Um, I think there were only like three cases before I got to SA. Yeah. So there's not a lot of people, and so the experience is kind of limited. Um, yes? You do uh, zero to eight cases a year, so everybody that does this, I guess they have a regular day job and they just do this on call or something? 
That's right. Can you repeat the question? Sure, sorry. The question was, uh, since we have so few cases in any given year, oftentimes we have no cases in a year, uh, the people, the medical professionals that we use to handle cases have day jobs. So they are surgeons by day, uh, perfusionists by day, and uh, there is a rotating call schedule. So when they have time off, then they are on call for us. That's how it works. How can you sustain financially with eight cases a year? I can't. That's why we are funded entirely by Life Extension Foundation. It is not sustainable, it is not profitable. It is extremely expensive. Yep. Open heart surgery, same thing we do in a vehicle, on short notice, anywhere, quarter of a million dollars per procedure. I think Medicare in some small places might reimburse like 60,000. Yes? Well, they might be interested in giving us money if they can get money for liquid ventilation, but most of them are only interested if it's a sure thing. Uh, the military uh, is mildly interested in suspended animation and profound levels of hypothermia, but they haven't had any uh, RFQs or requests for proposals uh, recently. And since our focus is taking care of patients, that's what we do. Um, when you do, do this service, um, when you do this service, um, how many are you doing as a standby? In other words, you're getting notice in advance. Is it 50%? You're doing, like, say, 24 hours or a week before, and 50% are after already pronounced dead? Uh, let's see. So. I, I'm guessing now, I would say probably 50 to 60% we have at least 24 hours notice. Um, we have different contractual arrangements with the different organizations. So with the Cryonics Institute and with patients who, who are members of Alcor who specifically request this service, we monitor patients. That means my nurse, who's an RN and the director of client services, is on the phone basically every day with one of our members, checking in, seeing how they're doing. If they're elderly or they're suffering from some sort of ailment, if they're terminal, then she's checking on them regularly. So we have some idea of where they're at on the continuum of death versus life. Uh, but with the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, that monitoring function is carried out by Alcor. And so we have no insight at all into what patient we're responsible for or where or when until they call us. And um, oftentimes uh, they have a process in place where they will accept somebody who signs up at the very last minute, just bring money, and uh, that means that we might not know about a patient until they are literally drawing their last breath. So we may or may not get there in time. Yes. Uh, could you go into more detail? Do they have to pay up front, or what is the payment for something like that? That depends on the organization that you choose for crowd preservation. So uh, we have different contractual arrangements, but basically when you, if you choose to be a member of the Cryonics Institute, then you will contract directly with suspended animation, and there's a payment structure or options for that. If you are a member of Alcor Life Extension Foundation, the services of SA are built into all of your Alcor fees, so it's, it's a whole package, and you, the pricing is basically, it's invisible to you. Thank you. Uh, Over here, and use the mic. Sorry. How many people are currently in this uh, 
And these frozen chambers, if you want to call them. Uh, let's see. I think there are about 200 people um, between the Cryonics Institute and Alcor Life Extension Foundation. That's here in the United States. There is also an organization in Russia called Cryorus, and they have a number of people in storage. Uh, and uh, let's see, there's another organization called the Oregon Cryonics Society. Uh, they're starting up a storage organization. There are a number of places elsewhere in uh, the world, in China and Australia. They're trying to start up their own uh, organizations. I don't really have too much insight in how far along they are. I've heard Germany also is working on one. I'm yeah. not sure. I, I get calls all the time. Uh, in the last 10 years that I've worked at this job, I've probably talked to a dozen different groups, and uh, a lot of, most of the time nothing happens, but uh, I keep trying. Other questions? Yes? The benefits. benefits of cryopreservation, benefits of suspended animation. Well, you keep talking about preserving the heart geared toward people that are on their way out with a heart or they're on their way out with another illness and you're preserving their body to do what if they're already dying? Right, okay, so um, most folks that I'm aware of, and I'm one of them, who have signed up to be crowd preserved, um, they're interested in having some degree of control over their life and their death. So a lot of people's lives, they feel like they get cut short. Personally, my to-do list is infinitely long. I won't finish it before I die. And I'd really like to see what comes next. Like, you know, travel in outer space or new technologies. And it may be that medical technology will eventually catch up and be able to cure all these diseases that we currently suffer from old age, Alzheimer's, cancer, but it doesn't look like it's going to help me. It looks like I'm not going to benefit from any of those breakthroughs because I'll probably be dead by then. But it is my hope that uh, these breakthroughs that come after I am already in a doer somewhere will still be able to help me and that I will be preserved in such a way with enough fidelity that and, and reversibly, um, that I can come back, that there will be technology eventually, technology we don't have now, and we don't even know what it looks like. But there will be technology that might be able to bring me out of the doer and restore me and hopefully even rejuvenate me. Maybe that's stem cell technology. Maybe that's uh, 3D printed tissues and organs. Um, maybe that's nanotechnology. I don't know. I, you know, it's kind of a, it's a dream kind of thing. So if that technology eventually catches up with whatever it is that killed me, in addition to old age, then maybe they can take me out and repair me. And I, I don't really want to come back as an 80-year-old Alzheimer's patient. I'd kind of like to come back something closer to this. Or maybe something better. I'd like an upgrade. Um, so that's kind of, that's the hope. Uh, it, Human crop preservation is, if not the grandest, one of the most incredible human experiments ever. When you sign up, you're signing up for a massive clinical trial. And the ones that go in the ground are the control group. Okay? Right? I'm just hopeful. I'm an optimist. You know, some people are not optimists and have no interest, and that's all right. More room for me. I have a question here, over here with Bob. Yeah. Sure. I know one of the problems with preservation has been the crystallization of the cells, the damage to the cells. Yes. What exactly do you infuse when you remove the blood? Right. So here's a distinction um, between what suspended animation does and what uh, a cry cryonics storage provider provides. So suspended animation is really interested in extending that window of time that your brain and the rest of the tissues in your body are viable. That means if we could fix all the other stuff that's wrong, the cells would tick over and keep working, all right? So you'd be good to go if we could just fix all that other stuff. 
And so that is organ preservation solution. It's essentially the same kinds of solutions that they use for kidney transplantation. Same stuff, okay? It only operates in the temperature zone above freezing. You cannot be frozen with organ preservation solution in you because if you are, you will turn into a popsicle, okay? What happens is when the solution freezes, it creates crystals, ice crystals. And these little crystals, they're like knives and they slice through the cells and they cause the, the freezing causes the cells to swell, okay? So there's mechanical damage, chemical damage, and the slicey thing, that's not good. So you don't want to be frozen. You want to be cryopreserved. You want to be vitrified. And that happens after we deliver to one of the cryonics organizations. They will perfuse you with a solution that's called a vitrification solution or a cryoprotectant. And this solution is very different. It's, people use the word antifreeze. It's not antifreeze, but it does prevent ice formation. It does prevent that swelling, that little sharp business from going on in the cells. It protects the cells and allows the cells to be reversibly stored at liquid nitrogen temperature. So if we could fix all the other stuff, the crowd protection part is reversible. Yeah? Yeah. So, <laughs> how you doing? My name's Greg Calabria. Um, can you talk about what the cost is? So I have three questions. The cost, uh, who famous is doing this? And uh, I would think that we'd be probably closer to be doing a brain transplant more successful than preserving the whole body because we are our brain. Um, so I can't speak too much about cost because, again, it, it's dependent. What you ultimately pay depends on several things. One, depends on which organization you sign up with. And they have very different pricing structures. Do they take insurance? They do. Yeah. So um, funding options vary from person to person. I know people who are wealthier than me who just walk up and handle the cash. Um, others, and I think it's probably the majority, the major certainly the majority of patients that we are responsible for at suspended animation, use a dedicated life insurance policy. Excuse me. Um, and that life insurance policy is exclusively for their cryopreservation and their stabilization and transport arrangements. So they allocate specifically funding to do that. Um, so Alcor Life Extension, as I mentioned, has a different pricing structure. SAs, services, and costs are built into their whole fee structure. They accept life insurance also. Other people use things like annuities to pay. Some people prepay. Some people kind of pay as they go. That's kind of risky, but it's available. Um, so the funding options are different. Uh, in terms of uh, are we farther along? Why, why not just do a brain transplant? Ooh, there's, that's a big, that's like a, that's a rabbit hole I could go down some evening. But um, basically, you can, you can sort of do two paths. You can try and fix what you have or sort of do substitution and replacement. And that's one philosophy, and that's kind of the cryopreservation philosophy, right? We know that what we have here kind of works, and there might be something better in the future. So if we save what we got, maybe part of my memory is in my heel. So I like my heel, I'm gonna take it with me. Uh, probably most of my memories, and the way we understand memory, is contained at, at some level, either in the physical or chemical structure of my brain, but some of it may also be in my spinal cord. So maybe I need that too. So, one philosophy is, okay, well, what we'll do is we will preserve to the best of our current ability and we'll try and keep up and, and keep improving that. So we preserve everything we have in ta as intact as possible. And then hopefully at some point in the future, we have, a we have a way to fix it, upgrade it, whatever. The, another path that you can take, and, and uh, these are only two, there are still more uh, things like uploading and um, using computers to essentially preserve yourself. Um, 
The other one would be, okay, how about replacement? So you give me a new heart, you give me a new liver, you give me a new kidney, why can't you give me a new brain? Right? Yeah, or just swap out. So at this point, our understanding of our physiology and how our brains work is rather incomplete. So that's the biggest barrier. Uh, there are two labs that are working on doing brain transplant, body transplants. So it's, it's not as crazy as it sounds. They are trying. But so far, the complexity is beyond our knowledge. We're trying to do something with an incomplete understanding of what it is we're doing. We're just going to try it, see if it works, and then figure out what's broken after we do it. Yeah. So in that case, so in that case um, who has been in this condition for the longest, and have they shown any signs of deterioration? Or is that also like a gamble due to the equipment hopefully being upgraded in the future? So. Um, once you have gone through the cryoprotection process and are placed in liquid nitrogen, uh, at the atomic level, there is no change. You become a time traveler, completely unchanged, <coughs> indefinitely. So long as you remain at liquid nitrogen temperature, you're a time traveler. Question over yes. here. Hi. Um, more so what I'm concerned with is that I think the idea and the concept of saying that the times are going to change and technology is going to change and the wishful thinking and the hoping that obviously there's going to be more processes and procedures in play that can kind of save you later even though you're not in the state to be saved because you're dead. You're dead. Yeah. Um, who's, obviously these facilities are monitoring you. Mm -hmm. Where's the funding coming from or who does the responsibility lie in when those technologies are available to help you? Right. Who's waking you up right. or who's responsible for making sure that these things happen so that everything you did to get to this point actually makes it worth what you did? Because if all these technologies are available but no one's really held responsible for these being active for you to happen later, then you're staying in the state that you are and things are kind of passing you by when... It's true. It's very true. So um, some organizations have it. Uh, they've set aside a certain portion of the monies that you pay in order to be cryopreserved. Those monies are set aside, reserve fund and a research fund. So they're funding research into revival, uh, rejuvenation, and reunification because integration back into a society might be difficult too. Um, there are also private individuals who have what are called revival trusts. People who sign up to be cryopreserved are encouraged to set aside monies for their own revival. Um, and there are some very big revival trusts, both private and public. Uh, will that be enough? Uh, will society be interested? Out of storage? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we'll just be, you know, like museum pieces. I have no idea. That's a fairly cynical view, and I'm not a cynic, so can't say. But uh, for that, not really. Uh, when you sign up, at least with uh, you know Alcor and and with the Cryonics Institute, there's a whole bunch of paperwork that tells you about the risks, um, and one of those is you know maybe you won't be in good enough shape to be revived ever. There's no guarantees of anything. Um, so it's one of <laughs> about a bajillion risks that you take when you participate. There's a question over here, Catherine. Sorry. My question is, it seems like if we're going to travel to other planets and outer space, that not only our government, maybe Russia, Ch China, I, I would think that there's other parallel uh, organizations like ours that are doing the same thing you're doing. Are you aware of any of this? Uh, I am aware of uh, various <clears throat> governments and military groups that are interested in reversible cryopreservation for space travel. Yep. I personally am not involved with that, but because I don't do cryopreservation research, I'm really on the more of the medical side. But uh, yes, there is interest. 
uh, kind of like the clinical trials that I talked about, it's not huge. I would expect it to be huge. I'm always surprised by how few people are really interested in this. I guess they just don't want to think about it. But I like to think about it, and I'm glad other people are thinking about it. <laughs> right? Right. Question over here. Yeah. You mentioned there was a um, whatever indefinite period. Has any an lab animal or anything, have you done any experiments where you've done short term bringing them back from that state of being frozen or however you're saying it? You know, right. Maybe a day, a few hours. Yep. So uh, again, we're kind of moving out of my subject matter expertise. Uh, but I can tell you, yes, there is a laboratory. Uh, it's called 21st Century Medicine. And this is a cryobiological research laboratory. They pretty much invented vitrification, which is the uh, reversible cryopreservation. And um, the scientists at 21st Century Medicine have been working for many years on perfecting reversible cryopreservation. And they have managed to reversibly cryopreserve rabbit kidneys, and they have managed to reversibly cryopreserve brain tissue slices. Now, cryopreservation is used every day in laboratories all over the world. Currently, we cryopreserve human eggs, embryos, sperm, blood vessels, uh, you know, oocytes, um, I don't know, all kinds of animal specimens are cryopreserved in the same, using the same technology that we use on whole human cryopreservation patients. Yes, I mean, I think the holy grail really is to be able to, you know, it would be really nice if, if we could cryopreserve, say, laboratory-grown organs, okay, and we can store them indefinitely forever. So, I need a new kidney, I just go to the freezer and what size do you need? And I just pull one out and they warm it up, they unload the cryoprotectant, they reimplant it, they perfuse it for you and Bob's your uncle. You're out the door with a brand new kidney. Wouldn't that be great if we could do that with all kinds of tissues, whether it's lab grown or donated or whatever. There's a huge waste of organs n n globally because we don't have a way to save them. They got donors, but the donors are over here, and the people who need them are over here, and the viability of that organ, because there's no SA, is like an hour, maybe a couple of hours. And that's not long enough to get it from point A to point B, or to cross type and you know, check and do the surgery and all that. So um, yes, the answer to the question is, there, there are uh, reversibly cryopreserved tissues that are in use right now. They are very close to being able to cryopreserve organs reversibly on a larger scale. Um, and uh, why haven't they brought back a whole animal yet? Well, there are rules that govern that. There are all kinds of committees that govern how you do animal research. And of course, animal research is controversial, right? And we're animals, and we're made of all different kinds of tissues, thousands of different tissue types. And each tissue type is unique, and it responds a little bit differently to cryoprotection and cryopreservation. And so the kinds of perfusion and solutions that you might use to preserve a kidney really, really well don't work so well on the heart and don't work at all on the brain. So when you try and pile it all together, <laughs> Uh, it comes out less than ideal. And they're not going to try and bring back an animal until you make sure that that animal is going to survive and not going to suffer. Okay. So until you can look at little parts and make sure that all the parts are perfectly, immaculately preserved in a reversible way, the whole animal is not going to be coming back. That's right. I have a question from Larry over here. Well, you might have answered some of it, but I was going to ask what parallel discoveries are coming up from this, just like when NASA did the space flights, they had came out with, this, with the pen that could write underwater, and just so many different than the watch. And I'm wondering what other uh, 
avenues of science are connected with you that are gleaning benefit from this. And, and also just the idea that how much Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo would have loved to have been able to see the human body from the perspective that you do now and how much development came about because a few people broke the rules and worked with bodies when they weren't supposed to. So sometimes we need to be innovative. Push it a little bit, yeah. Um. I actually, in, during a lot of some of my talks, I show a slide where there are a couple of guys in uh, like loincloths just literally flailing away at some guy who's lying on the ground. This used to be how you resuscitated people. You just beat the crap out of them and hope that they wake up. And sometimes they do. And then later on, of course, CPR came around and you see people pumping on each other's chest and doing mouth to mouth. And that was considered like crazy 50, 60 years ago. You don't do that. But now it's like, yeah, everybody does it. You got an AED on every wall, and the guy who used to be dead, absolutely dead, is not dead. Not by a long shot. So now you're not dead until you're warm and dead, right? And we're here to cool you. Um, so parallel technologies. Um, yes, I think most of the efforts right now with respect to cryopreservation are going into trying to create alternatives to animal testing. So you have uh, ways of testing on brain tissue, on uh, dermal tissue. You have these cassettes that are cryopreserved. You just put them in a little bin and you leave them in the freezer. And if you want to test a cosmetic uh, uh, you know, for liver or whatever, you just take out a cassette and you test it on the cassette. You don't have to go like kill an animal for their brain. Right? Same thing with lab-grown tissues. Well, there's all these really new, interesting 3D printing techniques that you can use to grow an ear or grow a larynx or whatever, but it's the same unless it's a cartilaginous tissue. If it actually has structure like a heart or a kidney, we have the same problem. It, it, you can't, it can't survive indefinitely in the laboratory. So if we could <laughs> cryopreserve it and throw it in the liquid nitrogen freezer, well, then it wouldn't be an issue, right? You could just ship them anywhere on liquid nitrogen and store them anywhere until you need them. Um, so, and then with respect to suspended animation, I talked about liquid ventilation. It's really our hope, you know, my dream, I don't know if I'll live long enough to realize my dream, but my dream is that one of those machines, if not the one from SA, maybe it's from another company that, you know, finishes the job or something, a liquid ventilation device that's, you know, maybe the size of a small cooler on wheels is hanging on a wall next to the AED in every building, every airport. It's on every EMS truck. And so when somebody has a heart attack or is in an accident or something and could benefit from cooling, if we only have somebody who knows how to stick a tube down their throat and connect them to that machine, that they have another chance to live without brain damage. Like, that's my dream, and that's a parallel technology. It's not there yet. It takes a tremendous amount of time, huge amounts of money to develop a medical device. But we keep going, we keep trying, we keep patents out there. So, you know, if we can't do it, I'll see if I can find somebody else to do it. <laughs> Right? Yeah? Got to take care of each other. I have a question over here for you, Catherine. Yes. Why do we have to wait until we die? Oh, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Because if somebody wants to stop the dying process now, to stop it in its path, can they be preserved and wait for a cure in the future? And my other question is about the soul. So, the body dies, but what's really coming back when you do come back? So the second question I will answer, but I'll let you go to the first one. I'm way out of my depth. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What was the question? <laughs> why, why do we have to wait till we Why do we die? have to wait? I wish we didn't have to wait. Uh, maybe someday we won't. Maybe someday we won't. Right now, there are eight transplant centers that I'm aware of. There may be others uh, that currently allow a person who is an organ donor and meets certain what they call extended criteria. Now this is a slippery slope, it's pretty controversial, I'm just providing information here, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. But in these eight transplant centers, if you 
or your family, if you are beyond the help of the medical community and you haven't signed up to be crowd preserved, but you have arranged to donate some or all of yourself and you are beyond recovery, in these eight transplant centers, they will put you on life support and keep your heart beating, keep things going. You're not really alive, you're, you're just functioning. Um, in these transplant centers, they will have your family say goodbye, they will move you into an operating suite, and they will then begin performing the exact same procedures that I do on human cryopreservation patients in order to harvest the organs and ship them out for transplantation into people who need them. It doesn't seem like that big a stretch to me <laughs> to be able to train these same transplant centers. They have the surgical teams, they have the bypass machines, they have the preservation solutions, they have the technology and the know-how to do our procedures. What I don't have right now is I don't have a reimbursement method, I don't have acknowledgement from the medical community that what we do is in fact useful medicine um, and that could be helpful and that we could reimburse them and it doesn't pose a risk to their certifications and their JCO status and it doesn't violate HIPAA and all kinds of things. And I've talked to some of these transplant centers, initial conversations, I and mean, they sent me back you know, to work on getting more information that would make it more acceptable to them. So in addition to the sort of cultural issue of, you know, we're still grappling with, do you actually control your own life? Right? There's only a couple states now where assisted suicide is allowed, right? Um, so as a, as a society, at least American culture still has trouble with allowing an individual to decide when it is they're ready to go and control when they go. Uh, it would be nice if, if people who signed up for human cryopreservation could choose when they go, when they have that happen. And maybe there has to be a process for that. There has to be psychological review and the docs have to say there's no hope for them and whatever we need to do to satisfy our conscience uh, and the legal system. Um, but right now, uh, there really isn't a rational reason that I can think of. Uh, we could do it right now, but um, there aren't any people willing to take that risk and do it yet. And actually, there is a there is someone who would do it, but they're not letting them, right? <laughs> so well, yeah. uh, there are there are uh, people who would like to do that, who know that the end may be near for them, and would like to, but uh, rules, regulations, laws. Yeah, and we may be getting closer. It. You know, uh, at some point, people say, "Well, why don't why don't we use the assisted suicide laws?" There are all kinds of complexities as to why we can't do that. Um, they are not set up um, the criteria and the requirements where you have assisted suicide, although it would help you on your way if you were cryopreserved, you know, just in an unconscious state or something. Um, but right now, the way they define uh, suicide and how you're allowed to do that leaves no room for cryopreservation in there. Um, so we'd have to change a lot of laws to make it okay to do that. And Catherine, the second question I'd like to address, and that was, well, what happens to the soul? So in this room and online, maybe we have 100 people total, and all 100 people have a different idea and have a different answer for you on that. Uh, there are people here that don't believe in the soul or the afterlife or the spirit or ghosts. There are people who are sure that, that, uh, that, that, that there is an afterlife and that there is a spirit. So uh, there is no one answer for that. Uh, I'd be very happy to tell you what I believe, and that would be something we can discuss uh, downstairs as we are now drawing end to, uh, an end to the, to the time that we have for this presentation. And that was a wonderful presentation, so I'd like to hear our appreciation very much for Catherine. Thank you. Was well done. Very well done. So good. I know a number of you have not considered cryonics and perhaps have only heard of it for the first time this evening. And for those of you who are interested in cryonics, please talk with me after the event or visit the cryonics table, which is downstairs, where you can get some more information on that. And I know you have many more questions, but Catherine will be around. Actually, she's going to do a tour of the ambulance uh, after the event, after we're done speaking. So we'll, uh, you'll have a chance 
to do a tour of the ambulance as well as to speak one-on-one -on -one with Catherine uh, this evening. But before we do that, let's bring up our own founder and a great man, Mr. Bill Falloon. Yeah. I need to put in historic perspective the incredible presentation you just sat through. In 1975, I attended the first meeting of the Cryonics Society of South Florida at the home of Austin Tupler. He's in the back of the room right now with his two sons. There were about 15 to 18 people at that meeting. It's a nonprofit group, and we were trying to figure out what are we going to do? We all wanted to be cryopreserved. Of course, that word wasn't even used back then. It was just simply cryogenics, cryonics. We wanted to be preserved for future reanimation. And we had no idea what to do. There was no Catherine Baldwin. There was no suspended animation. What we did have was a verbal agreement with a funeral home that said, if one of you die, maybe I'll help with the icing. And I'll use my embalming machine to run some DMSO through your body to minimize minimize some of that freezing damage. We had no place to store the patient. We didn't even know who to call. There just wasn't anything around in 1975 of substance. Nothing close to what you just witnessed tonight as to what suspended animation does. And that's just maybe 5% of the whole cryopreservation procedure. There are surgical teams at Alcor and at CI in Michigan who uh, do the vitrification procedure. They, they have very secure areas to store the patients. We had no idea where we would store one of our members if they died. We had life insurance back then. We just didn't know what to do with the patient. So everything you've seen tonight is a culmination of a lot of volunteer work by many, many different scientific individuals over a 41-year period of time. It didn't happen overnight. There were a lot of primitive technologies that we put into place just to stop gap measures until we could get medical people on board to do this kind of work. And what Catherine and Suspended Animation have done is nothing short of unprecedented. The medical community in the past would not cooperate with us. We relied in many cases on licensed embalmers. I am a licensed embalmer. The reason I am licensed and trained was to perform cryopreservation procedures. Fortunately, you don't have to rely on me. You've got trained cardiothoracic surgeons. You've, you've got people trained in medicine, not in mortuary techniques, to implement this procedure in a significant way. So it has improved in a, in a dramatic way. And what you've seen tonight, again, is a culmination of a lot of volunteer work. These are all nonprofit type endeavors. Suspended animation is owned by a nonprofit organization. The board members are all fully signed up cryonics members. And it will always be run by fully signed up cryonics members who intend to keep suspended animation funded, continue to increase the funding when the money becomes available. So we do have perpetuity in mind with everything we are doing. Now, Catherine's going to take some people on tours of, of the van. I don't know how many people uh, each she's going to tour, but I will be happy to answer any specific questions you have about cryonics. I am in a position to answer every single question that was asked to Catherine because she specializes so much in the emergency response aspect of cryonics and in the research and in the liquid ventilation. There's so much she's doing that I can perhaps answer some questions. And, and by the way, between Alcor and the Cryonics Institute, there's probably about two 270 total patients around the world. There's many more. We just don't always have the ability to keep track. There are, with Alcor, over 1,000 people fully signed up for cryopreservation. I believe the Cryonics Institute may have more than 600 people fully signed up. If any of you are interested in cryopreservation, it's critical that you sign up ahead of time not wait until you become ill, because then you're going to need a lot of money to pay for it, whereas life insurance can be very inexpensive. But there's also an issue of you fall ill, you may not be in a position to implement the paperwork, the legal procedures, all, everything that has to be done, trying to do that at the last minute, almost guarantees there's going to be a delay. And as you just heard, delays are not good news. So for those who are interested, you just log on to Alcor, log on to the Cryonics Institute, just type cryonics into Google, you'll find these non-profit organizations. They're all non-profits, by the way. Cryonics is not a money-making venture. There are trust funds set 
decide to keep these patients cryopreserved in perpetuity, and there are revival trusts designed to pay for research and reanimation expenses. So there's a lot of thought being put into the perpetual nature of everything we're doing. So I'll be happy to answer questions, and I think at the same time, Catherine should show some people the, uh, the, the cryo uh, mobile operating unit, uh, because it is really a spectacular piece of technology. Everything had to be miniaturized. Everything had to be thought out ahead of time as to what you do with a wide range of different cases. Yeah, there's only, what, six people per tour? Or? Yeah, right. uh, I think a maximum of six inside the vehicle. There's almost always one of those right in there. But, uh, okay, so we have three already going down and uh, then two more. And then if there's any questions, I can answer them right now. The entire body is cryopreserved if that is the option you select. Uh, the, 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 the remains, as you call them, we call them patients, they are cryopreserved in a liquid nitrogen doer that keeps them at minus 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, those remains could theoretically be cloned at some point in the future as a reanimation technology. They do have containers to put them in that are special to keep them at a cool temperature. In some cases, they're able to keep liquid circulating. I don't know the answer to that question as well as I'd like to because they continue to upgrade their transport capability. And theoretically, air ambulances could be used if people want to pay the, the cost of it, and they could keep the liquid circulating. But normally, once you reach a certain temperature and you've already perfused the patient with the cryo uh, protectant agents, not the vitrification agents, just the anti-ischemia cocktail that they're using to keep the blood circulating so that no clots develop, to keep certain uh, cellular events from not occurring. Once you stabilize that patient, you've got a significant period of time to transport them to Alcor or Cryonics Institute or the Oregon Cryonics uh, Society facility. You've got a, a window of opportunity at that stage to transport them to an area where the surgical procedure can begin. Well, at this stage, um, scientific people are more interested than at any other time in the past. There is a document that about 70 mainstream scientists logged on to, MDs, PhDs, some of the greatest experts in the world, such as Marvin Minsky. He, he deceased uh, recently, by the way, and rumor has it, he was cryopreserved. If it were not for Marvin Minsky, by the way, you would not probably have your cell phone, you wouldn't have GPS. He is one of the fathers of the information technology age. But uh, nonetheless, the uh, scientific community, of course, for the most part, does not accept cryopreservation of humans at this stage, but an increasing number are. But what's impressive is, let's say Alcor has, oh, 1,100 people signed up. A significant number of those people are highly educated uh, medical or computer uh, engineers. They, they, they tend to be the, the upper scale individuals. It is a remarkable low number. The first person was cryopreserved in January 1967. That was uh, Professor uh, James Bedford. Uh, he made his own arrangements to be cryopreserved. He set up his own trust fund, and he was cryopreserved. Very poorly, but nonetheless cryopreserved. His trust fund was not adequately protected. Relatives raided, raided it, stole all the money. Alcor maintains Dr. Bedford in a state of cryopreservation. Alcor's policy, and I believe the Cryonics Institute's policy, is we never let a patient thaw. We'll, we'll get donations, we have money put aside for emergencies, no patient will ever thaw, and when Dr. Bedford was faced with being cremated, Alcor stepped forward and they took possession of his remains. He is in a state of cryopreservation and will remain in a state of cryopreservation courtesy of the charitable work that Alcor has done. 
Yes. Alcor and Cryonics Institute have full-time people who are at the facilities who maintain the cryopreserved patients. Cryonics Institute relies on very dedicated volunteer labor for the most part. Alcor has a professional staff of paid individuals, but there are people on Alcor's premises 24 hours a day. There are all kind of alarm systems built into the cryo containers, so if liquid nitrogen were to get low, a lot of people would be notified to go and refill them. Uh, some of them are inspected every single day. There's a lot of maintenance that goes on to ensure that people remain cryopreserved. There have been some famous people. Uh, Ted Williams, one of the more famous people, because we're not old enough, we don't appreciate who he was, but he's the last baseball player to hit over 400. And he, if it wasn't for the Korean War, he may have been the greatest baseball player of all time. He, he went twice into uh, combat. He was a great pilot, but he was one of the greatest hitters of all time. Ted Williams, uh, his, his son also, a couple of years after his, his son died, uh, uh, cryopreserved. Um, Dick Clare, comedy writer for The Carol Burnett Show and many other television shows, um, he, he deanimated around 1987, was cryopreserved. Um, there are some uh, quasi-famous people, and I passed that rumor around, um, you know, Marvin Minsky, again, a rumor, but I, I believe it's factual that uh, he, who's in many respects more famous than anybody because of his genius, his ability to come up with what we take for granted every day, i.e. our smartphones, the internet, GPS, we, we take that all for granted, and if it wasn't for Dr. Minsky, we may not have that. Well, that, that, that's the situation. Some people sign a document where they, they don't want certain information to be made public, and then other people say, well, if it gets public, it's okay if it spreads around. Uh, more and more people, though, are coming out and being open about it because this is a scientific experiment, as Catherine eloquently stated. You can be part of that control group, you can be buried or cremated, and you almost certainly will stay dead. Or you can participate as an experimental subject, and just maybe you'll be reanimated. Yeah, that big legend of Walt Disney, he wanted to be cryopreserved. Elvis Presley wanted to be cryopreserved. They failed to make arrangements ahead of time. And I believe Larry King is another one, by the way. He wants to be cryopreserved. He said so on numerous national TV shows. He wrote it in his book. I don't know if Larry has fully signed up. We call them cryoprocrastinators. Uh, uh, it's people who really want this, but they just don't want to go through with all the paperwork. And if you don't do that, it's a, it is a problem. Yes. Whole body cryopreservation probably is done more for psychological reasons than for rational reasons. I am a whole body cryopreservation patient. Bought my life insurance long, long ago, so it doesn't really cost me a lot more, but it saves a heck of a lot of money if you do just a neuropreservation. The reanimation theories are that your body probably will be cloned, it will be replaced in so many different ways that it, you want your central nervous system intact. And that's what the neuropreservation does. The rest of your body, the fact that those other tissues get damaged in different ways, not that big of a deal. Yeah, you don't want to be autopsied if you're a cryopreservation patient. So we wear bracelets that indicate no autopsy. We carry cards in our wallet. We've managed to save a lot of patients who are going to be autopsied simply by identifying an attending physician who would say, and it was truthful, of course, they died of natural causes. In some cases, the doctor's out of town. You get his partner to agree that the death certificate will be signed. So when a, a person goes down suddenly, you identify what disorder may have caused them to die, and often they were under medical treatment. It's just a matter of finding a doctor who will tell the medical examiner that was a patient, 
I know why he died, and I'll sign his death certificate, and you avoid the autopsy. Now, if a homicide were to occur, and we've had situations where people have drug overdoses, they have traumatic accidents, what we've been able to convince some medical examiners to do is a virtual autopsy using a CAT scan. And they can pretty much see the whole body with a CAT scan, take all the blood samples they want, do a visual examination of the body, and we've been able to avoid a full autopsy on many cryonics patients. Thank goodness for CAT scans. Okay, group, we're going to go downstairs and have our social, and I'm going to thank you all for attending.